For those of you who have not come here regularly, you can ask questions through the chat, but it should be a little box on the bottom of a toolbox at the bottom of your screen. If you don't see anything there, just scroll down to the bottom and it'll appear. You can just click chat or you can aim a question at one person or all of us or whatever you choose, type it up, we'll see it. Um, most of you will be muted all the time. And we'll ask questions at the end. So when you're ready, Rob, take it out. Oh, I should actually, Rob Steele, we've, we've known Rob since he was about knee high. So he comes from a family of alpha owners. Uh, his dad, his grandfather, his uncles, all heavily into Italian cars, repairing Italian cars, driving Italian cars. So, and they work on them, all of them. So take it, Rob. That's true. So yeah, my name is Rob and I do come from a, a family involvement in Italian cars and I'm heavily infected with, uh, I suppose you could say the alpha virus. Um, I live in Michigan. I currently work in the auto industry for one of the automotive suppliers and um, my hobbies include most things automotive and in particular uh, transaxle cars and uh, transmissions. So um, I'm, I'm certainly well steeped in alphas. My first car was a 164. I had five of those, for better or worse. I had a couple Milanos, and I think I'm up to 13 GTV6s. And the other driver is a Julia, and uh, it, it's just it's a lifestyle. But uh, anyway, Dave and I were going back and forth on on putting something together for this, and um, I suggested I could do something on transmissions or transaxles. And I suppose why listen to me on that? Um, I suppose. I've done a good number of them. My first one was several years ago and I was kind of forced into a box where uh, I wasn't able to get one done. And since then I've lost count. I mean, dozens and dozens and um, gearboxes and transaxles. So some of the things I'm going to be going over today are uh, based on my firsthand experience, interactions with vendors, engineers. My previous employer was actually Centerline Alfa Romeo. I worked as a product development guy there and um, worked with Joe regularly. And it was a really great experience and, and a way to really appreciate more of what goes on behind the scenes for this hobby. Um, and then furthermore, some of the top tier technicians uh, all over the world for Italian automobiles and specifically Alpha. So I'm gonna try and bake that all together and, and pull some reasonable things out of there that might be relevant for a, a rebuild. So we probably won't have time to get into everything in full detail. Um, there's quite a lot of content you can go over on transmissions and just parts in general, but um, we'll get through some of the uh, so-called secret sauce that I work into some of these and you know, we'll leave room for questions at the end. So <clears throat> why rebuild anyway? Um, a few things, uh, any observed deficiencies during operation like uh, noisy operation, grinding shifts, popping out of gears, uh, big stains on the floor. Uh, those are all pretty good indicators that it's time for a, a rebuild. Um, and be particularly aware if your trans has stopped leaking, it's probably because it's empty. Um, so keep an eye on that. But uh, furthermore, there are not new transmissions available. So rebuild is really the only option if you're going to freshen these sort of things up. So again, my purpose here is not to replicate things that are available resource-wise and shop manuals and online tutorials. I meant to bolster some of those uh, resources with some firsthand experience and expertise from those wiser than I. Uh, and we'll spend a good bit of time looking over some of the nuances of parts, how they affect operation, original versus aftermarket and, and things like that. So <clears throat> first things first, uh, prepare your workspace, clean everything. Um, you're going to want a clean counter space and lots of it. This is a space where I do a lot of my work and it doesn't need to be fancy, but um, you're going to want to gather your, your workspace and your tools and uh, any special tools. So uh, for example, in the transaxles, you're going to need a big hydraulic press, a torque wrench, some square drive bits and, and a large crow's foot. Um, but those are the sorts of things that you want to ac access and, and be ready with uh, from other resources. Um, and then probably one of the most important things is you're going to want a camera, you use your smartphone or whatever, but uh, pictures are going to be very, very helpful throughout your process. Once your workspace is ready, I'd say you want to prep your trans. And those of us familiar with the Alpha Owner's Bible remember Pat Braden's advice to wash the car before you work on it. That's a good idea. 
And so is cleaning the exterior case completely on any component work you try uh, on your bench. Uh, anything that's left behind is gonna contaminate your hands and your workspace. And it's just gonna slow things down and introduce additional risk. Um, this is a pretty clear before and after. Warm pressure washing, washing works pretty well. Um, dry ice blasting is sort of the ultimate way to do it, but it's, um, it's pretty difficult to find. But if you can find it, I recommend it highly because it doesn't introduce any foreign debris media uh, or water, um, and it leaves a very clean surface to work with. So once you've got your trans <clears throat> exterior cleaned, you're gonna to wanna to drain the oil. And the oil and your drain plug is going to tell a story. Um, the magnetized drain plug is gonna have things tucked to it. Uh, it's best to take good notes and pay very close attention to what's coming out of your trans and what's on that magnet. This can give you a head start on the rebuild uh, needs assessment as it can point to issues beyond common synchronizer deficiency uh, and things that hide beneath the surface uh, missed during a casual inspection. For example, um, you know, a rocking gear bushing is going to be um, easy to detect once you've got it apart, but you might get a head start on that if you notice that there is a lot of yellow or brown deposits uh, in suspended in your gear oil. Um, and first uh, thing to notice about draining gear oil is it's going to smell. Um, if you've never smelled gear oil before, it's not the most pleasant thing. Uh, it's from the additive package, there's usually a lot of sulfur. And uh, don't be afraid of darkened oil on its own. Uh, darkened oil can be okay. Uh, what you're looking for is particles and if it uh, is still somewhat translucent. If your drained oil is opaque or exhibiting any of these other deposits, uh, which I've kind of categorized here, um, it's not a good sign. But um, an overall grayish appearance is still okay because these transmissions and transaxles use molybdenum uh, coated parts on the synchronizers and in the common case transaxles on limited slip clutch plates. And it's, it's sort of the uh, magic material that promotes smooth shift action. It's a, it's a really good material, but it's not perfect. Um, one of the drawbacks of that material is it has a very high affinity for itself and uh, it can glob up and cause inconsistent shift performance, inconsistent differential lockup performance if you have too much molly suspended in the oil. Uh, in extreme cases, it'll actually gall up and ruin sliding surfaces. Um, the key takeaway here is there's no filter in the lubrication system in these transmissions and transaxles. It's a bath, and it is very important to keep uncontaminated oil in the trans for best performance and, and long life. So we'll get an example here. This is a transaxle I did um, a couple of months ago. The guy said, yeah, it's got some issues. Um, as we can see, uh, the oil, um, this is the transaxle case. This is a drain pan. It's a little unclear from the photo and it's dripping out here just outside of the view of the photo. And this is the gear oil. Um, what can we see here? We can see that it's almost totally opaque and contaminated. We have multicolored deposits. We very clearly see, um, yellow and brown on the bottom right portion of the photo there. And <clears throat> there's a degree of gray fuzz that you can see on the right. Anyhow, um, the drain plug has heavy ferrous deposits on the magnet and the greenish tint is likely due to the original hue of the oil. Um, oils can come in slightly different colors and you know, you have greens, yellows, but they're all very translucent. Um, the heavy giveaway here is are the, are the sludge and the, the opaque nature. So take note of that. So next, what do we see here? Um, we've got signs of trouble. So we're gonna check the drain pan for additional issues. And what we see here is um, deposits left behind. The, uh, the yellow arrows here are pointing to large bits of ferrous material that uh, did not stick to the drain plug. You're gonna wanna look for damaged synchro parts or gear teeth and situations like that. And in this case, it was a chunk of reverse idler. And then these little bits that with the red arrows are actually non-ferrous soft metals. Uh, like uh, in this case, it's bronze from a gear support bushing. Uh, these were ejected. 
uh, when a bushing spun from either a, some sort of vent or uh, inadequate lubrication. And um, that gives you a head start on what to look for. And on the right hand side, a green arrow is pointing to uh, deposits left behind after draining. These are very excessive. You do not want to see this, this kind of level of deposits. And this indicates at very minimum a much extended drain interval. So uh, after you've gone through your oil and taken note, you're going to want to start your teardown. And this is where the real fun begins. And don't forget to take pictures. So this is where you want to take a look at everything, spin things over by hand, check for damaged teeth, check for looseness, and take notes. Because once everything's all blown apart and on the bench, it'll be difficult to assess a, uh, a loose bearing where you get some rocking when it's assembled, but not when it's part. And um, get good pictures of everything again. So preliminary inspection before you start tearing everything down, um, you're going to be able to gather some intelligence. And so here we have the gears on the pinion shaft and the transaxle. And there's a few things you can get a head start on here. In the absence of a test drive, you can still have a very clear picture of which synchronizers are going to be working properly and which synchronizers are not going to be working properly and which gears are going to be um, grindy. So the green arrows here are, I'm sorry, the green circles here are indicating good, clean engagement teeth with good, clean synchronizer appearance, nice and even, and uh, you shouldn't observe any deficiency in shifting in those. However, if you look to the right, um, this is a pretty common thing to see in alpha gearboxes, especially on second gear, and in fact, that is a second gear. What you're seeing is the, uh, the molly coating that we discussed earlier is worn clear off and we're down to the steel, steel substrate here of the synchronizer. And you can see clear evidence here on the teeth uh, here, the engagement teeth. They're nice and, and flattened, um, which is an indication that something's been grinding for a while. So this is where you wanna start and, and get an idea of, of your parts needs. We're gonna cover those deficiencies on individual part components in the very near future here, uh, but these are the main indicators. So once you get your chest uh, disassembled and you get down to the gears, you're actually gonna wanna take each gear off and separate all the pieces. Here is an assembled gear with synchronizer parts and snap ring, and here is the same with uh, all the pieces separated. So uh, you see on the right, we have the gear, followed by the engagement teeth, followed by the synchro, followed by the synchro brake assembly, followed by the snap ring. Uh, the process of this disassembling is, is, is covered elsewhere, but just know you need really good snap ring pliers to, to get this done and uh, beware of flying snap rings. So let's get into inspecting the synchro parts. Uh, the synchronizer on these, these gearboxes and transaxles, they use Porsche style synchronizers. It's a very high performance design. Uh, it has some drawbacks, but it works very well and is used by a, a lot of manufacturers. And there's three main wear parts in this style of synchronizer. You have the ring, which most people just call the synchro. Um, you have the uh, synchronizer outer ring sleeve, usually called a slider. And then you have the engagement teeth, which are usually called a dog ring. Um, they resemble dog teeth. So anyway, each of these are going to be inspected. And from there, you make your decisions on what is reusable. So knowing that, we can get into some of the finer points on inspecting your parts and scrutinizing uh, potential new parts. So here's where you'll repeat after me, all aftermarket parts are not created equal. Uh, seriously, uh, it has been a major problem. I know that when I was at Centerline, we fought very hard and Joe was very committed to dealing with these sorts of issues. And I, I'd say that it's, it's a real problem. Um, and in North America, it's, it's difficult for customers to to um, leverage these sorts of things because our, our correspondent volumes are low. But um, I got to see it firsthand and share in some of these frustrations. Um, and some of you may have dealt with aftermarket part issues, quality department, but um, the good news is there's a lot of uh, excellent solutions now and we'll, we'll go over some of those. So those three components that I mentioned to you earlier, this is sort of the holy trinity of wear parts in these gearboxes. And uh, you have the ring here, the engagement teeth, aka dog ring, and the slider. So we're going to get into how you scrutinize these properly and where you need to replace. So 
Let's start with the synchro ring. This is the part most people call the synchro. All four of these are contemporary aftermarket production from different manufacturers. Um, you might see part of the problem here. There are varied profiles, notch openings, and chamfer finishing on these notches. And uh, each of those has a consequence in how they work. And one thing that's not usually captured in a photo is uh, how round they are and the actual tension provided by the steel substrate. Uh, one of these is Italian uh, in this batch. And those are actually the ones that are available uh, from Centerline. And they're probably the closest to the original, but uh, there's still some other issues, which is just the nature of aftermarket parts. And the rest of these likely come from Asia, even though they get repackaged and sold as German or Italian made parts. So beware of that. So these are the same four synchro rings, and this is a good opportunity to point out <clears throat> some of the deficiencies. As I noted, there were four different profiles, uh, four different Molly textures. You know, these all look different. Uh, you have machining differences on these notch openings where the uh, anchor goes for these synchro brake assembly. And then you have uh, machined versus hand finished openings. And then again, to mention the, the steel substrate differences and um, roundness differences. Um, my personal preference is because of common stock uh, availability on, on vendors worldwide, I basically avoid aftermarket synchros completely at this point if budget allows and, and go with um, original equipment synchronizers, which are still available. Um, those are made by Getza. So this is the show and tell here. It's quite clear the differences. Um, this is an original Alfa Romeo it gets a synchro on the left here. You have machined openings, machined chamfers, a very high quality fine Molly coating, and you have a nice round even profile. So some of the obvious differences in profiles here, the one you definitely want to avoid most if you're able to scrutinize these parts is one like on the far right. Uh, this will come from an unnamed vendor, not in North America. But as you can see, it's very flat. And this is a problem. Um, someone tried to get clever at some point and reprofile the synchronizer and basically try and account for future wear by making it a square profile. And thus, when it's worn, will be the correct round profile. The problem is, is that it causes local, heavily, heavily localized wear. Um, and will basically prevent good and consistent engagement forever. Uh, so this is what you want to avoid at all costs, are these square profile rings. You want to take note of the round profile and fine machined openings when you can. And uh, I think that some of the aftermarket suppliers are trying to move to incorporate these additional finishing steps, and it's probably going to increase the price, but it's going to get you a better part. Um, I would highly encourage you all to consider the gets a synchro as a, the ultimate solution for, for this. So now that we've seen some of the common aftermarket ones, what about the ones that are in your trans? So um, here we'll show you, this is a, a second gear synchro, pulled off a second gear, and this is a, a common sight. Um, it's heavily worn. And you'll see that it's, it's no longer round in profile. It is totally worn through the substrate on the backside here where it rests in the engagement teeth. And it's difficult to see, but on the back side, uh, through the notch opening, um, there's clear wear of where the um, synchro brake assembly has been slamming into the back side of the substrate. Versus a new one on the right, differences are pretty clear. Um, it's a nice round profile, and you have a good even opening, and it's just the right shape. So. Um, we see what not to use on the left. If you, see, if you see any evidence of substrate on your synchro all the way around, you can pretty much count on that synchronizer being worn beyond service. And if you see any heavy grooving on the backside of the synchronizer where it's locked against the engagement teeth, um, you probably are going to want to discard that synchro and uh, do not consider it as a usable synchro. But sometimes you'll get in there and you'll find that used synchronizers are actually almost like new. So I've given some examples of that here. Uh, these are synchronizers that are removed from various transmissions and um, they're used, some of them unknown high mileage, 
but they're still like new. Um, I believe these are original alpha based on the, the telltales that we discussed before with the machine finish on the openings and things like that. Um, but the way you can tell if you want to reuse a synchro is um, a nice round, even profile, good molly coating coverage, and no significant grooving. Even under this very, very bright LED lighting when this picture was taken, there's just a very faint line here where uh, it just started to um, leave a witness mark where it engages on the backside of the engagement teeth. But I would consider these nearly new, um, but because of the labor and time involved in doing a transmission, I would say you'd want to relegate these to higher gears. Uh, and I would say fifth, then fourth, and then perhaps first gear, if you're not doing a lot of stop and go driving in that order. Um, budget should decide how much you really want to spend on it. But I would uh, say that a baseline a consideration for rebuilding any alpha gearbox is going to be two brand new synchronizers, um, usually three. So we've gone over the synchro rings. Let's move to the second component in that uh, assembly that deserves a good bit of scrutiny, and that is the, the slider. So um, this is a good used original slider um, removed from probably third and fourth gear. And the arrows here are indicating what you want to look for. You see a, a distinct tooth profile on the, uh, on the teeth all the way around. You don't see any burning marks anywhere. And you see a nice pointy shape when you look at it from this angle. This is a nice reusable part. And I would encourage anyone that finds a slider in this condition in their transmission to consider it a reusable part. So let's look at what most sliders end up looking like when you pull them out. Um, on the left here, very flattened profile. The point is almost completely gone in some of them. Um, and then from the right, this is another common thing you'll see is, is missing or heavily damaged teeth from rough shifting or incomplete clutch engagement or who knows, discard, don't, don't use these parts. So <clears throat> um, now that you know what to look for on, on your sliders and you've got them out, um, let's look at some of the options that are available because right now the landscape for sliders is, is not very good in my experience. So on the left, we have a new old stock, fresh out of the box slider and um, I'll zoom in a little here. As you can see, have a very nice sharp tooth profile, a nice machined finish on all sides that are relevant. And then on the right, we have a, a common stock aftermarket unit, um, which we'll look at in detail in a little bit here. But the finish differences are quite obvious. Um, and under intense magnification, you'll be able to see that there are some very serious differences that I believe preclude their regular consideration for a, a transaxle or transmission rebuild. So the first major issue with a lot of these sliders are the tooth profile. Um, the ramps are completely different. And the way these ramps are designed um, are so that they mesh properly and engage properly with the dog ring uh, or the engagement teeth on the gear. Different profiles give a different feel and the shallower engagement teeth on the aftermarket unit are going to give a, a higher resistance shift in most cases. Um, and generally the engagement dynamic is going to be quite different uh, due to these designs change, design changes. Um, one of the worst consequences I've seen on some of these aftermarket uh, sliders is that uh, dimensionally, they're not consistent, and some of the teeth are absolutely the wrong height. And what that can do is wear a groove into your synchro ring and uh, wear the molly coating completely off. And um, as it just so happens, one of the worst things that can sometimes happen is if you have a square profile aftermarket synchro ring and an aftermarket slider, you can have a, a blocking condition where you basically uh, have extreme difficulty shifting because you've worn through the frictional coating on the synchro ring and you have this blunt tooth that's having a hard time getting over the edge of the synchro ring. Uh, the thicker profiles, they just don't work. 
Uh, and this incorrect profile causes issues. And um, some of these design changes could be made advantageous, but the problem is, is there's not one claim system out there with matched synchro rings and sliders that I'm aware of that's properly toleranced. Um, and it, it would have to be sold as a system. And, and right now that's just not happening. Um, and so my suggestion at this time would be to try and retain um, good used ones or scrutinize um, common aftermarket units for, um, for closer resemblance to the, the originals. I know that there's changes being made all the time, um, but I have not observed one out of production probably in the last several years that has actually been congruent uh, with the original stuff. Um, here's a second view uh, to note the tooth profile and size. And um, a lot of these commonly available aftermarket sliders, on, like on the right here, um, are made in Asia, even though some are repackaged and sold as Italian or German by, by those Italian and German vendors. Um, I've consulted with some subject matter experts on these things. And the information I've received is that the, the brooches and specialized tooling used to make some of these um, sliders are, are being recycled and sharpened and reused. And this causes some, some serious consistency uh, and quality issues. And um, more recent aftermarket parts that I've sampled um, show evidence of surface grinding to kind of try and remedy some of these things. But um, if you actually put them on a dial indicator and, and check for run out, they're not, they're not uh, round and can cause some vibrations. Um, but the most important takeaway so far still is that um, these experts, um, they, they comment on the alloy that's actually supposed to be used on the originals and they've um, analyzed the original materials. And based on what the pricing of that material actually is, um, it's impossible for these aftermarket ones to be made from the right material, at, at, let alone any of the manufacturing or finishing costs. So there's probably still some progress to be made on that. Um, and incidentally, the, the closest sliders I've observed in, in the aftermarket altogether that actually are, are closest to the originals are, are coming from Centerline and one of the Italian suppliers. Um, but it's something to check on. Um, if you have time to scrutinize it, I would definitely do so. Um, so the third part of the synchronizer is the engagement teeth, AKA the dog ring. This is a very, very important part. And uh, it was considered a non-serviceable item and indeed, it wasn't available as a serviceable part unless one purchased a complete gear. And um, now that you can't purchase complete gears, it's, it's kind of moot. But um, these engagement teeth are pressed onto each gear. Um, the, um, the outer synchronizer slider uses friction to slide over the ring and engage with these teeth. Um, and then they're locked together. So in actual fact, when you're grinding a gear, quote unquote, the grinding you feel on a worn synchro is not grinding the teeth on the gears themselves. It's actually the small pointed teeth on these engagement teeth against the small teeth of these sliders. They're very small parts and they're actually quite fragile um, when you start grinding them. So um, let's take a closer look here at a couple of dog rings. So. I'll uh, draw your attention here. The, the green box surrounds a, a good used dog ring. You can see all the teeth are nice and even. The profile is consistent. There's no teeth missing. And then compared to the red, you'll see these are smashed down. You've got one missing here. And then looking carefully, you can see that it's divoted. Um, it's a nice section of material worn in the middle of the top of the tooth there. So these are the sort of inspection things that you're gonna to wanna to take a look. You, these are your inspection points for scrutinizing your dog rings. Um, the good news here is, um, I promise Centerline's not paying me anymore, but the, the only person on the planet that actually is contracted to manufacture these things properly is, is Centerline. I know that they offer them to other vendors and it's a very handy service part because if in the absence of a good use part supply, um, if you were to put a new synchronizer and a new slider with the gear that had this dog teeth, you're going to end up with very poor shifting anyway. Um, you just don't have a good ramped surface to make engagement between these parts. Um, so 
take these points very seriously and examine your dog rings because they're probably one of the most important things uh, for shift quality and that final engagement where you're actually engaging the gear fully and um, don't, don't underestimate how important these pieces are. <clears throat> the full process for removing them is covered pretty thoroughly elsewhere, but I wanted to just point out, I use a pretty simple tool to press these apart. There's dog teeth on the gear, uh, beefy bearing splitter, and uh, you clamp around the grooves here and press off. So here's where I'm gonna get in a couple of secret sauce um, considerations that are not covered in any of the resources that I've encountered and uh, something that is pretty important. So these are your gear bushings. Um, gear bushings that allow excess radial movement or rocking will prevent all of those synchro parts we've just discussed from engaging efficiently. Uh, those parts are going to work best when they're engaging in a square manner. And if you have a gear that's rocking on a shaft, um, it's going to try and roll that part together and it's not an efficient movement and that'll, that'll do goofy things in your shifter, but it just leads to improper shift. Um, replacing the bushings is, is covered elsewhere, but one of the things that I've observed a lot is bushing walk. And this is a particular bad case. This bushing is walked all the way to the thrust surface of this gear and will block lubrication from escaping in these notches. So, um, Sorry about the blurry photo, but on the right shows after correction, you uh, use a mandrel to press it back down into the center of the gear. It should be centered with um, four and a half gaps is the same in the gear. And once you're centered, you're gonna wanna perform the, the notching modification, which is um, part of the secret sauce. I'm just waiting for the next slide to select here. Okay, pardon me. So um, this is a very important step and it is gonna ensure that you've got good lubrication into the synchronizer assembly. Um, the yellow arrow is pointing to the notch modification, which is usually performed on some gearboxes from the factory on the early cars. I, my observation is like uh, before 1984-ish, 1985. And then after that, they just stopped doing it and it causes problems. Uh, but once they're in place and they're notched, there's a little bit of locking compound around here to keep it from walking and um, then give it a light surface home. All right, one more secret sauce modification here is changing the uh, first gear dog ring out for a second through fifth type synchro break and aligning your notches on your dog rings. Just note the red arrow here is pointing to where you're gonna align your dog ring with the notch you've just cut in the side here. You want the opening of your dog ring to align. This is gonna pr provide fresh lube feed to the entire synchro and uh, give you a nice consistent lubrication. So the first gear fix, as it's called, is pretty well documented online, but it's worth pointing out here because you have sort of everything in one place. You have your notched bushing here. You have your aligned notch back here. And then we're gonna convert here from one brake strip inside the synchro to, to two brake strips. And I'll show this part break out again at the end. For those of you watching that are concerned about transaxle stuff, there's one other thing that's really worth pointing out. And it's a very common failure item on teardown and that is the first gear synchronizer. Um, Alpha thought it would be nice to <clears throat> add a, a spring-loaded first gear synchro, which will give you a nice soft engagement from neutral to first. But I've seen situations like this on the left very frequently. I'd say uh, maybe a dozen or so out of the transaxle I've serviced. This is a particular bad case where it's escaped past the synchro hub and, and totally broken it off. Um, but I would suggest converting all of the transmissions, whether you have a 105, 115, or a transaxle to a uh, second through fifth type and uh, utilize the additional um, synchro engagement potential because uh, some of you out there may have noticed that even though your car shifts fairly well, when you go from neutral to first at a, say a stop sign or a stop light, you'll still get a crunch out of first gear. And that's because uh, there is no brake strip and you only get partial engagement energy transmittal 
into that uh, one-sided brake assembly. This takes care of it and with modern lubricants works pretty well. So um, now that we covered some of the basics of the synchros and some common fixes, uh, one of the things I've been asked about a lot is the lightening of gears. And um, it's a strategy to increase synchro life by reducing the rotational inertia, but it's a trade-off. It does make the gear weaker. And there's some chatter about foaming, uh, gear foaming uh, or gear oil foaming. I don't know how academic that is. It's not really an observable thing. Uh, nobody's peeking in their trans when it's working. But um, anyway, as far as lightning goes, um, <clears throat> you will notice a difference in the shift performance if you are, are pushing the car pretty hard, but it's very costly. And because the gears are very hard, uh, this, this modification is gonna require good tooling and a careful machinist. Um, I chose these two photos because it shows a couple of approaches on how to lighten gears. Um, on the right-hand side, this photo is uh, courtesy of Merrick Carden. You see all of these gears have been back cut. The uh, original casting surface is, is gone, machined back, and they've been drilled. And then on the left uh, is a transaxle I did uh, not long ago. And um, we decided we're drilling all the way through without any back cutting. And uh, we cut windows in some of the uh, medium-sized gears. So after you've made those decisions and picked your synchros, you go to reassembly. Um, there's no uh, no magic recipe here other than to say, keep things clean. Uh, start with another fresh, clean surface. Uh, and again, any contamination on your work surface, it's gonna end up inside your transmission and it's not gonna do you any good. Um, so the phrase on reassembly is reverse the order of disassembly. So I suppose I'll leave it at that. Um, but this is probably an opportunity for you to review some of those photos you took during the disassembly. And one thing I would encourage you all to do is make sure you test shift the transmission before you do final sealing and certainly before you install it in the car. Uh, transaxles in particular are prone to accidental engagement of the fifth and reverse fork outside of the selector shaft sweep uh, during the case joining process. And if you do that uh, and then you get it installed, you're going to have to pull it out and pull the front case off again to, uh, to fix that. I figured that out on my first build in my own car. Uh, that was not fun. So some tips and guidance for no leaks. It's pretty simple. This stuff right here. I've got the part number for you. It's Permatex Ultra Gray. Um, this stuff is sort of magical. Um, it's highly resilient to gear oils and it's been recommended by many of those technicians that have contributed some uh, expertise on some of the findings I've shared today. And um, it just flat out works. Get your surfaces clean. I don't use the applicator nozzle. It puts out too much product and can lead to inconsistent squeeze out. I instead use a gloved finger and uh, it works very, very well. So once you've got it all sealed up, um, we'll talk about oil for just a moment here. It's not another oil thread, don't worry. Uh, the takeaways here from, from me are, don't fear the modern lubricants, they do work. Uh, just choose the right spec. I always use conventional uh, oils for initial fills in the original spec. Um, and those of you with the standard gearboxes, make sure there's no additive for limited slip diffs um, when you're putting it in your gearbox. It is a synchronizer performance decreaser and uh, you just wanna avoid that stuff. Um, and those of you with limited slip transaxles, I always start without additive and use the same oil. Um, if the differential chatter becomes excessive, you can add a little bit at a time, but it's, it's gonna decrease your synchro performance. So a couple of tricks for break-in. Um, some of it's a little counterintuitive. First of all, make sure you fill it with oil. Um, there have been instances in the past where I've spoken with people that have installed their newly rebuilt transmission and they complain of weird behavior. And the question, what kind of oil did you use is asked. And then they're awfully quiet on the other end of the line. Um, so make sure you fill it with oil. So after you've gotten some mileage on it, and getting some heat cycles through it, drain it while it's warm and um, really get it all out of there. Uh, but during the break-in period, you need to be gentle for just a little while, maybe 100, 200 miles, get everything up to temp. But once you've got a few hundred miles on it, um, you don't want to baby it at all. Overly slow shifting or pausing at partial engagement, like uh, a common practice for a worn gearbox, is just touching the point of engagement on a 
on a synchro and then pulling it into gear. That is a very bad practice for breaking in a new gearbox. It's probably one of the worst things you can do actually because it's gonna wear a, a groove into uh, the synchro ring. Um, you want to pick a velocity on your shift. Don't baby the shifts and um, complete the shift all the way. Uh, what you're doing is breaking in the slider teeth, which are ramped against the synchro ring, which is a curved surface. Um, pausing in neutral is okay, but when you select the next gear, pick a velocity and pull through. Make the synchro work through the full range. Um, your first oil change, uh, you'll expect to see quite a bit of gray fuzz as those molly coated parts get to know each other. But um, one of the things I like to do is put in an extra strong drain plug with these, uh, I don't know, rare earth magnets or something here. They're commonly available size and they are far superior to the originals and will collect way more stuff. Um, if your first drain interval shows up with more than gray fuzz, like chunks, you gotta go back in there and figure out what's going on. But after that first change, um, basically you refill it with your favorite gear oil, um, put a couple of good options up here that I, I particularly like and you're good to go. Uh, don't be alarmed if shifting is tight for a while, but things should wear in nicely. And with the modern lubricants and some of the tips and scrutinizing ahead of time that you've seen here, uh, your trans should last a very long time. And in fact, could last longer than an originally alpha built trans in some ways, coupled with these modern lubricants and modifications. So um, I suppose that is a, a quick walkthrough here. And uh, I know it's brief on a bunch of different points, but um, if you guys have any questions, I think now is the time that we're going to get into it. And uh, thank you. Uh, this is John Horn. I've got a rather specific question, but I've just been reading through my manual. Uh, I have an 88 Spider that I'm probably about to pull the tranny because it's got a couple of minor issues, but it doesn't need a rebuild, but a couple of things need to be done that I have to take it out of the car. The, the manual kind of implies that you just leave the starter hanging on the engine. When you pull, it tells you to pull the three bolts that hold starter, but it doesn't tell you to take the starter out. Is that correct? You know, um, I couldn't answer that. I'd say that you probably want to leverage a resource like the Alpha Bulletin Board for that car. I know that on my father's uh, Julia Spider, I believe we just left the starter up in that location and pulled the bolts but I don't know what the nuances are for removal on the series two, three or four cars, but I know it's cramped in there. So keep your fingers Thank you. safe. <laughs> Thank you. Rob, this is George Schweichel. I've got, I've got a question. I currently have a, have a transmission of part because <clears throat> several years ago when I reassemble it, I did not uh, properly bend the lock tab on the shift fork bolt and it unscrewed itself uh, with uh, no consequences other than not shifting. Mm -hmm. uh, on some of the alpha bulletin board, one of the alpha bulletin board guys suggests leaving the lock tab off and using red Loctite with a stronger bolt. What, what would be your comments on that? I like the lock tabs, but um, I would suggest using the lock tabs, but making sure your grooves are aligned. You'll notice when you have it apart next time, well, you have it apart, there's grooves yeah. there. Make sure they're right. locked in place. And there's a couple of different locking compounds out there, uh, Henkel and Loctite and Permatex. They all make different uh, flavors of the same product, basically. Um, I believe the green, there's a couple of different greens. One of them is, is meant for wicking for threads. And there's another that's used as an actual locking compound. If you want to make sure that's not coming out, um, you're going you're gonna to want to use the heavier. Um, I think they call one semi-permanent, one permanent. You're going to want to use the permanent one. And what do you? Okay. What do you think about? I just got some higher strength bolts from uh, from uh, McMaster Car uh, with uh, higher torque ratings. Uh, what, what's your thought on using a uh, a small inch pound a torque wrench and the higher torque ratings on the bolts? You could, but just remember that they're going into a material that Alpha deemed appropriate for use with that original fastener. Um, mm -hmm. I'd be worried about damaging the receptive, the receptor threads in that case. Um, I, I don't think there's really much reason to go to a higher torque there. 
not much torque required to lock things together in that case. You just don't want it to loosen. And that's sort of the purpose of the lock tab. And there are other instances of, of that, but um, I think a locking compound might be your, your friend in that case. Locking compound and a tab. Okay. <clears throat> Can the dog rings be prepared at a machine shop? I don't think that's cost effective. Um, I would say, uh, I would say no on that. Um, new ones are a couple hundred bucks, I believe, at the last time I looked. And machine shop time is quite expensive. Let's see here. Um, bearings and gearboxes. Oh boy, that is a, that's a can of worms. Um, there is a whole thing about bearings and counterfeit bearings and things like that. If you can find original bearings in, in the alpha box or old packaging, that's always your best bet. Um, but uh, bearings are getting tough. Um, I do know all the ones that I dealt with when I was working at Centerline were high quality bearings. We didn't have any issues with those. I can't remember the, the brands that, that we're using there, but using a, a reputable bearing house will probably solve some of your counterfeit uh, issues. Let's see from George, GL4 or GL5 on a 73 Spider. Uh, in the trans, technically GL4 is what you want. A GL5 will have higher sulfur additive content, which will make it even stinkier. And those are really meant for high point gear and differential applications, even though some GL5s can be used in GL4, but um, a GL4, a high spec GL4 will actually be better in the gearbox itself. Um, would I be willing to suggest a recommended trans fluid replacement interval for street and track? This has never really been established. Uh, sure, I would recommend on a fresh trans, you do a couple of changes with cheapo oil early on and, and clear your magnet. Um, oil doesn't really wear out, but it starts holding a lot of junk. And what you worry about is what is the oil holding? Um, that's going to cause your issues. So if you go, uh, for example, if the trans doesn't have any miles on it and it's just sitting there, it's not really a time thing. I think it would be more of a use thing. It doesn't oxidize as readily as engine oil. It's not getting heated the same either, but um, it's, it's tough. Everyone's a little different. Um, the best answer for engine oil stuff was always to get an analysis and build your, build your interval from there. I'm not sure if that would be too much to ask for a gearbox, but the gear oil is pretty cheap. And um, if you do it every, the way these cars tend to be used, Every uh, 15, 20,000 miles, I imagine, be well more than what you need after the initial couple of fills, which are going to gather the majority of the, um, the majority of the things in the oil that are going to cause the most problems. Let's and for track? And for the track, if you have a transaxle car, I think you probably need to change the gear oil every couple of hard track days. The amount of heat that's introduced into the transaxle is going to break it down very quickly. And um, when you break down that oil, you're going to be putting a lot of additional particulate matter into the oil and you're using it hard. You can get extremely accelerated wear uh, when you have that much metal in suspension. Um, on a transaxle car, I'd say you want to change it frequently. Um, after every race weekend, I would say, unless you've got a dedicated cooler and filter. Um, and um, on a Spider or GTV type trans for track, um, if you're keeping all the oil in it and it's not flying out the top, um, I'd say you could you can check it. You, you know, open the fill plug and pull a little bit out um, after you've just run the car um, on the street or just idled it and stir up the oil a little bit. See what you've got. If you've got a lot of um, oxidation or some shiny bits of varying colors like we went over, you're, you're gonna wanna change it. Uh, but the transaxle cars are a special breed and they, they really need a little extra attention because you've got a gearbox, a differential, brakes and exhaust all occupying the same kind of lunchbox size space. And it's, it's not a good fight, it's not a fair fight and the oil and brake fluid suffer because of it. So um, we have a Milano that has a vent on top Brought vapor after a short drive, change lube every four. Boy, I'm not sure. It sounds like the um, sounds like the vent, which is normally got a little blocker in it, is uh, maybe a little too open and it's just flinging out there. What you could do is get a little piece of rubber tubing and make like a question mark shape, and um, that'll prevent it from from throwing it out at the top. Yep. Yes, that's correct. Yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Rob, if you go to chat, there's six more questions waiting for you. Oh, all right. Let me. Um, it's it's tough. Everyone's a little different. 
Um, the best answer for engine oil stuff was always to get an analysis and build your build your interval from there. I'm not sure if that would be too much to ask for a gearbox, but the gear oil is pretty cheap. And um, if you do it every, the way these cars tend to be used, every uh, 15, 20,000 miles, I imagine, be well more than what you need after the initial couple of fills, which are going to gather the majority of the um, the majority of the things in the oil that are going to cause the most problems. Let's and see. for track? And for the track, if you have a transaxle car, I think you probably need to change the gear oil every couple of hard track days. The amount of heat that's introduced into the transaxle is going to break it down very quickly. And um, when you break down that oil, you're going to be putting a lot of additional particulate matter into the oil and you're using it hard, you can get extremely accelerated wear uh, when you have that much metal in suspension. Um, on a transaxle car, I'd say you want to change it frequently. Um, after every race weekend, I would say, unless you've got a dedicated cooler and filter. Um, and um, on a Spider or GTV type trans for track, um, if you're keeping all the oil in it and it's not flying out the top, um, I'd say you could you can check it. You you know open the fill plug and pull a little bit out um, after you've just run the car um, on the street or just idled it and stir up the oil a little bit. See what you've got. If you've got a lot of um, oxidation or some shiny bits of varying colors like we went over, you're you're gonna want to change it. Uh, but the transaxle cars are a special breed and they they really need a little extra attention because you've got a gearbox, a differential, brakes, and exhaust all occupying the same kind of lunchbox size space. And it's, it's not a good fight. It's not a fair fight. And the oil and brake fluid suffer because of it. So um, we have a Milano that has a vent on top, brought vapor after a short drive, change lube every four. Boy, I'm not sure. It sounds like the, um, sounds like the vent, which is normally got a little blocker in it is uh, maybe a little too open. It's just flinging out there. What you could do is get a little piece of rubber tubing and make like a question mark shape. And um, that'll prevent it from, from throwing it out, out the top. Replacement gear bushings. So that is a whole separate subject uh, because when you replace the gear bushing, you have to make sure that it's machined on center from the mesh of the tooth and not from the pilot on the center of the um, gear. Um, I know that Centerline had those. I know that some of the other usual suspects carried some of those bushings, but a, if you've got a relationship with a skilled machine shop, you could actually have them made um, pretty inexpensively. And then you just wanna cut some, some um, grooves or spirals in them, uh, or you could have them dimpled or scalloped. But um, I think there was there was commonly available replacement bushings that are good at sizing them. That's important. Important. Let's see here. Are the 101 non Molly box parts the same as Molly box parts, other than the rings themselves? No. Um, the the guts inside the synchro brake, <clears throat> which I will pull up here. These parts over here, they're different. There's their size different. And um, there are other minor differences here and there. There's, some, there's a high degree of interchangeability on the dog rings. I've, I've used them both ways without negative consequence, but the sliders are different, the synchros are different, and these brake strips and stop quadrants are different. So um, I would say if you're gonna be building a, and updating a one-on-one non-Molly box, um, you're gonna have to pick a recipe and decide what you wanna do ahead of time and don't, don't mix and match. Uh, I personally think that the, um, the, the Molly Synchros perform very, very well. And other than the couple of considerations early on, they, they are a better performer. Um, there are some differing opinions on that, but um, it, it's, it's a good thing. And they're most compatible with uh, modern lubricants and, and they last a long time when they're treated well. Okay, Milano with chatter on startup that goes away with warm up. Okay. So uh, that's probably more likely due to the l uh, cranky nature on cold start and um, inconsistent idle speed. And if you're getting a rattle out of your transaxle, um, it's most commonly coming from the clutch housing. And um, if it goes away completely when you push in the clutch right away, uh, that's usually the case. If you're hearing some gear turnover and tick over at idle, when, but that's normally only when the gearbox is hot, 
that's nothing to be concerned about. There's lots of little bits inside the gears and things with low viscosity oil. Sometimes you can hear that when the car is idling. So I think I've gotten through the, uh, oh, here's one. Can 105 gearbox have 101 input shaft swap for use in 101 cars? Uh, there's a bunch of different ways you can mix and match um, bits uh, between later cars and earlier engines or gearbox from a later car and an earlier engine with uh, sizing the, um, uh, the pilot bushing in the back of the crank. Um, and then also there are different ways to accommodate the seal size differences. I know uh, when I was at Centerline, they had uh, bushings for that and seals for that. Um, and you can, you can definitely use a, a later box in a 101, but you can also convert your, your 101, which is substantially similar other than the uh, end of the input shaft with 105 uh, and 115 guts, which is what I actually did for one of my father's uh, Julius Spiders and that car drove very nicely. Let's see, reverse gear is very noisy. Uh, reverse is very noisy in these cars. Uh, they're all straight cut and you have a little itty bitty idler that ends up spinning very fast when you start reversing into normal speeds. Um, but any anything other than a smooth wine is probably a chipped tooth. Uh, reverses are non-synchronized on all of the gearboxes we've discussed today, 105, 115, uh, transaxle, 101, et cetera. Um, so you either have to pause and wait for the shafts to stop spinning to engage reverse or touch any forward gear and then go to reverse. That'll prevent you from chipping away at the teeth. But um, yeah, reverse can be pretty noisy. Let's see, popping out of gear. Popping out of gear um, can be caused by a couple of issues. You're normally trying to uh, eliminate the external causes of that, which could be linkage um, in the Milano or GTB6 or interference between the body, console, rubber boots, et cetera, of the shifter on the um, gearbox cars, uh, causing it to um, pop out due to uh, drivetrain rocking on throttle off throttle. But if it's popping out of only one gear, um, worn synchronizers, the, the slider locks over the synchro ring and a severely worn synchro can, can cause the uh, parts to separate. And once they start to separate a little bit, it acts like a ramp and pops it off. Um, so I would eliminate your external sources first. And um, from there, you might have to dive into it. Gear noise, when you back off throttle in first, second, not third or fourth, professionally rebuilt. Uh, only in first and second. Interesting. If you hear gear noise on D cell only. So there's one thing that it could be, which I encountered on a trans. Um, it was actually gear noise under D cell in all gears, but because the transact or the transmission and motor mounts were so heavily worn, in the high torque gears in first and second, the rocking of the trans was significant enough to touch the body and transmit all the gear noise into the body. Um, but if it's just in a couple of gears, and it's the higher torque gears, I would suspect a, a bearing. I'm not sure how you would narrow that down without inspecting it, but um, that sounds like a bearing to me potentially. Check your gear oil, see if, um, See if you've got any colors that are coming through um, after you run the gearbox for a little bit and open up the fill plug and, and use a straw or something, get some out and see if you have any uh, bits in solution there. Rob, this is Doug Zates. I, it's too much to type. So I wanted just to ask you, sure. I have an 86 Alpha, Alpha Sud Sprint. Okay. And I was driving on a tour a few years ago, and I was shift downshifting, not hard, coming into a curve from third to second. And it felt normal. It shifted down. And when I let the clutch out, I was in neutral. There was no gear engagement. thought, this is very strange. I went back through, shifted it again, and it did come into second gear. 
and off I drove a little bit further, third, fourth, as we went down the hill. Come to the divided highway at the bottom of the hill, start out in first, cross across the first lane, shift to second, let the clutch out. I'm in neutral again with traffic coming at me. Mm -hmm. It has done this, I think, in all gears, but fifth. I've uh, put the car up on my lift, removed the, the pan, no chunks of metal, no strange stuff. Where should I look? I'm not looking for a, a total diagnosis, but what could be potential causes for the intermittent engagement in different gears? So that car, if I'm not mistaken, that's a, a boxer engine front transaxle alpha and uh, uses a long set of links to go from the shifter to the, actually, you know what, let me just. Uh... Yes, it does. It oh, has, it does. The, the it's three, pull, the three shifter the rods are on the bottom of the transmission, so I can see them with the cover removed looking up. So it sounds like you have a potentially, if it's using a traditional fork and slider arrangement, you have a shift fork or forks that could be loose. And sometimes it'll grip it, sometimes it won't. Um, but because of the linkage and bushings that are on that system, like the 164 probably, um, I would start there. And even if you're moving the shifter into position where you typically would expect engagement, if you have a bushing that's weak and it's rocking, um, sometimes you might maximize your travel on the shifter, but you have not moved it in a sufficient, uh, not, not moved it sufficiently at, at the actual trans or inside the trans. But um, yeah, that's an interesting one. It, it's when you started it off, uh, when you started off telling me that um, it would sometimes grab second, that can be a symptom of a fork that's loose. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Oh, I noticed that John Horde, hey, John Horde, uh, another fellow Detroiter there. Uh, he suggested maybe a sticky clutch cylinder not engaging the clutch. So yeah, that's possible if it's in all gears, but um, I imagine you'd have some correspondent uh, observed deficiencies in the clutch operation or on the, at the pedal. So yeah, that's yeah, I'll, 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 I'll take a look at that. That's a great suggestion. Thank you. Okay, I think, I don't see any more questions come in. That was a good number of questions. Thanks, guys. Rob, this has been wonderful. Thank you. Sure, my pleasure. I, uh, a lot of this stuff typically uh, falls under what I like to call the umbrella of useless information. So it's nice to be able to share it. I hope it becomes useful for some of you guys. Um, I know that Dave, uh, you've got my email and you're welcome to share that with the club or make available if someone has some questions, but. Um, We'll do that, I mean, and I hope we can snag you for another tech session sometime in the near future. Yeah, there's a lot you could dive into. Um, I've been doing a lot of these transaxles, so uh, the differentials, um, like the trans, uh, like the gearbox portion, the differentials. Um, there's a lot of uh, applicable concepts to to both. So, so next time maybe we study from your room. You can do this from the back of the service van. Oh, oh yeah. yeah, from the Julia and Trazi wagon. Yeah, yeah. Well, I got to bring my dad in for that one. I'll need his permission. Last time I uh, got busted driving alphas without permission uh, uh -oh. when I was quite young, I got in pretty big trouble. And you I know, wanted probably. to know if you wanted to adopt me. Yeah. <laughs> we got room. Okay. So, Outstanding uh, presentation, Rob. Outstanding. Thank you. Oh, thanks, all. We will be processing this video and doing a little bit of editing, cut out the dead spots and, and trim the ends. Uh, Lance um, Dong is gonna do that for us and we're gonna try to get it posted to the AROC YouTube channel probably by next week. So it'll be available. Wonderful. Thank you everyone for coming. Hope you enjoyed it. It was an informative session and Thank we'll you. let you know as soon as you get the next session lined up and locked. Till then. Thank you. Thank you. Have a great time. Thank you very much. AROC Detroit. Thanks, everyone. Thanks very much. Hey, guys. Thank you.